So uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, uh, delighted to be here. Thanks to, uh, to Zohar and his colleagues uh, for having me here. Um, I'm Robert Jackson from Columbia Law School. Uh, and I'm going to uh, talk today about executive compensation. It's a little ironic, I think, to have someone who writes about um, incentives to be presenting right before lunch. <laughs> because you know, I believe that people pursue that which they're motivated about. And uh, you know, as fascinated as you are by executive compensation, my guess is you're more interested in lunch. Uh, fortunately, our incentives are aligned, because I'm also hungry. <laughs> Uh, so I'll try to be relatively, uh, relatively brief. So um, uh, in, in the United States, there are, there's a debate right now, just as there is here, about executive compensation and particularly CEO pay in public companies. And the reason, the motivation for this debate is that in public companies, as has been mentioned before today, have dispersed shareholders. They have uh, shareholders who are spread out, who have few incentives to monitor what the directors do. Because that's true, it's thought that the CEOs of public companies can exercise a great deal of influence over the directors who set their pay. This is a theory sometimes known as the managerial power theory. And the theory is that the CEO has enough influence to get the directors to pay the CEO higher amounts, more money than they otherwise should, than would be in the shareholder's interest, and to not align the pay of the CEO with the performance of the company. That is, not to make the CEO's pay contingent on the value of the firm in the way the shareholders would like. That's one possible theory. Another theory in the United States that's very common is sometimes called the optimal contracting theory. This theory says, look, yes, there are conflicts, there are problems, but we have markets. In labor, in corporate control, we have lots of different types of markets. And this forces the CEO and the directors to come to a CEO pay bargain that's most efficient for the shareholders. And there's a vociferous debate in the United States between these two uh, theories, and there's not that much empirical evidence, there's not that much data about these theories. So in this paper, I'm going to try to, uh, to offer some data uh, on these questions, on how CEOs are paid and whether or not it's likely to be in the interest of the company's shareholders. And I'm going to do that by reference to private equity owners. And they've been mentioned here before. Private equity owners are in many ways a type of controller, a type of controlling shareholder. And Professor uh, Goshen mentioned earlier that these controllers offer two things, one of which uh, we should be careful of both of them. They offer, on the one hand, better monitoring. And on the other, there's some risk that they'll try to extract some benefits. Yeah? We're going to see in my evidence, I think, that both of these things are true, that both of these things happen in public companies in the US. And I'll show you uh, how. So um, it's well known that private equity firms are very good at running companies, that they reduce agency costs. Uh, they're very good at corporate governance. Uh, but there's not that much known about how they pay their CEOs. Why? Because the companies are private. And private for a reason, right? They don't have to tell anybody about what they do. And for that reason, there's not a lot of good evidence about how private equity owners pay the CEOs of the companies that they own. But in this paper, I try to give some insight about that. And here's how I do it. When private equity owners in the United States want to sell their company, they often take them public. And when they do, they have to file a statement with the SEC that describes how they've been paying their CEO over time. So I wait for uh, private equity firms, very big ones. I, I focus on Clover Kravis Roberts, KKR is a, a private equity firm you might know, Blackstone, uh, Bain Capital, which was not so well known until the recent presidential election. Uh, but uh, these private equity owners bring companies public. I wait for that to happen. And then I draw by hand from these filings data on how the private equity owners pay their CEOs. And I get about 100 uh, firms over a period of five years. And I look at these companies and how they pay their CEOs to see how do these private equity firms that are really good at monitoring pay their executives. Then on the other hand, I match those firms with regular public companies. Yeah that are similar in terms of industry and size, but, and age actually, in terms of how long they've been public, but have dispersed public owners instead of the private equity type owners. And I compare these two to see whether or not there are significant differences when it comes to CEO pay. 
Now, just to give you a summary sense of uh, how these things are different, I've got about 500 observations of private equity owned companies and uh, public company CEOs. Uh, what I find is in general that the CEOs of private equity owned firms are a little younger and have spent a little less time uh, as the CEO of the company, but otherwise the two sets of firms are relatively comparable. And remember I said earlier that there's two ways in which the CEO's power in a public company might influence her pay. On the one hand, she might get paid too much, and on the other hand, she might, her pay might not be linked to her performance as well as it should. So let's test these two uh, hypotheses with these data. What the data show me when I compare the average CEO's value of, his, of her pay to the, uh, in a private equity owned firm to that in a public company, I find no meaningful differences. So when I look to see is there evidence from the private equity data that CEOs are paid too much in public companies, I don't find any. I can say more about that if you like, about whether and what that means exactly for policy implications. But when I present these findings to the private equity owners, they tell me that's not that surprising because they're in a competitive market. To convince a CEO to work for their company, they have to induce them to leave a, a public company. And for that reason, they pay competitive wages. This is what they tell me. But when I look at the relationship between pay and performance of a CEO of a private equity owned firm, which I measure in two different ways, I'll say more about that in a moment, I find that private equity owned firms have much stronger links between pay and performance than comparable public companies. Financial economists tend to measure this pay performance link in two different ways. Uh, one is by trying to figure out if the value of the firm increases by $1,000, how much of that does a CEO personally internalize? That is, how much does the CEO's wealth change for every $1,000 in firm value? Another measure is how much does the CEO's wealth change for every 1% change in the value of the firm? And I use both of those here. This is the $1,000 measure. This is the 1% measure. And what I find is that in both using either measure, controlling for differences in industry and differences in Tobin's Q and all kinds of things that financial economists care about, that CEO incentives in firms owned by private equity are more than twice as strong as CEOs in a comparable public company. So even though they're paid very similar amounts, the link between pay and performance is much stronger in private equity owned firms than in public companies. You might be wondering why, and one hypothesis I offer in the, uh, in the paper is that CEOs uh, of public companies manage to persuade boards of directors to let them diversify their wealth. So even though they pay them in stock, they eventually allow the CEO to sell these shares because the CEO, like any other person, doesn't want to be exposed to the future of the company. But private equity owners will not allow this. Yeah, if you work for Colbert Kravis Roberts and you tell them I'd like to sell your shares, they tell you to go look for another job. Yeah? Their rule is you get out when I get out and they enforce it. And I'll show you a little more evidence about that in a moment. But the important thing to see for now is that this means that the relationship between pay and performance in uh, private equity owned firms is much stronger than in comparable public companies. I'm happy to talk about this kind of thing if you like uh, over lunch and nobody will take me up on that, but I hope. But, um, uh, but anyway, these are more extensive regressions that show the two points I've just made for you that the levels of pay are not statistically meaningfully different between private equity owned and public companies, but the link between pay and performance controlling for all kinds of different things that economists care about is much stronger in private equity owned firms. Oh, one more note. You might be thinking, by the way, look, maybe this isn't because private equity firms are better monitors. Yeah, that's the theory I've offered you so far. These private equity guys are really good at watching the CEO, fighting them and making them have a link between pay and performance. Maybe it's not that. Maybe these private equity guys buy companies where the CEO already has a good pay performance relationship. Yeah, maybe so maybe the cause runs the other way. It's not that they go in and make the CEO work harder is that they find companies where the CEO is already doing this, and that's why I find the result I do. So I test for this. What I do is I look for companies that are bought by private equity firms. I find 50 or so of them. I get information on their CEO's pay. I match them to public companies, and I look for a difference. Yeah, Because if this alternative view is right, then I should find that those that are targeted by private equity firms have already stronger CEO incentives. So I run this test, and I find no difference. So I find that, the, that uh, private equity firms do not go to buy CEOs who have stronger uh, incentives. Instead, what I find is when those firms come back to the public, they have stronger incentives. And this is, I think, very powerful evidence that it's the private equity firms monitoring, that it's they're forcing the CEO uh, to work harder, that strengthens the pay performance link.
One other thing that I think shows this very clearly, as I mentioned to you before, the private equity firms are taking these companies public, and this gives me a nice opportunity. I can follow, after the IPO, what's happening to the private equity firm's ownership and what's happening to the CEO's incentives. So I do. The private equity firm takes the company public. They start to slowly sell off their stake. And here, I'm showing you in the left uh, uh, chart what the percentage is that the private equity firm owns. You can see in the, at the time of the IPO, they tend to own 60 to 70%. Then over time, they sell off. And by the last year, they own only 10% uh, uh, of the company. Uh, um, and here, I'm showing you the, um, uh, the, the uh, average private equity ownership compared to the CEO's incentives. And what I find is that over time, as the private equity firm sells at stake, the CEO's pay performance relationship weakens. That is, the CEO begins to sell his shares. This, too, is powerful evidence of what the private equity firms told me, which is the CEO gets to sell his shares when I get to sell my shares and not before. These charts suggest that as the private equity firm walks away from the company and they stop watching, the CEO begins to weaken his pay performance relationship, which is exactly what we'd expect on a monitoring story. This is a regression that just basically shows that, remember I told you earlier, we measure the pay performance link by CEOs in terms of a $1,000 change in firm value and how much does that affect her personal wealth. What I show you here is that uh, the percentage of the firm that the private equity owner holds is statistically significantly positively related. That is, as it rises, statistically significantly, the uh, incentives of the CEO also rise, which is, again, consistent with this monitoring story. That is, if, this, if the private equity firm has a big stake and their representatives are on the board, the pay performance link is much stronger than it otherwise would be. So I told you we'd look at two sides of this story. One is that private equity firms are good monitors, and that's true. It looks like they do a better job than public company boards at linking pay to performance. But you know, there's another side to this story that Professor Goshen mentioned earlier. That's the possibility that a private equity firm will want to take benefits, uh, uh, private benefits of control. And I find some evidence of this as well. What I do here is just take the CEOs of the private equity owned companies, and I separate them into two groups. I say, look, was the CEO present at the company when the private equity firm bought the company? Yeah, just one, zero. I call the CEOs who were there when the private equity firm came to buy the company incumbents. And I call the, C the, new, the, the CEOs they hired afterwards new hires. That is, I just separate them into two groups. We have incumbent CEOs who were there when the private equity firm showed up, and new hires who were brought in uh, by the CEO after the private equity firm took over. And the reason I'm interested in this is, you know, there's some concern, as has been explained before, that private equity, uh, that when buyouts occur, especially leveraged buyouts, that there might be some conflict uh, because the CEO is sometimes participating in this buyout and the, the public shareholders might uh, lose out, might not get some benefits of control. So I just examined to see whether there's any evidence of this in the CEO's pay. And here I find a striking result, just comparing the amounts of pay of the incumbents to the new hires, controlling for all kinds of differences in age, tenure, I take out golden parachutes, I find that the incumbents earn about uh, seven, 50 to 75 percent more, uh, statistically significantly more than new hires do. And I have to say, the private equity firms who really like the first half of my study, they don't like this part so much. They say, look, we're really good at hiring CEOs. That's part of what we do. We're really good at figuring out how to run companies. To which my answer is, well, why do you pay the old guys more than you pay the new guys? And it raises a bit of a concern because one theory, and not, I don't prove this, but one possibility at least, is that they pay the old guys more because the old guys have control over the transaction in which they sell the firm. And private equity firms being so good at what they do, it's hard to imagine they're paying them more for nothing. Here I've controlled away effects for CEO quality and for tenure and for all kinds of other things, industry. So I'm a little concerned, perhaps, that their private equity firms are paying them for something else. I think this evidence just shows us a couple of things. First, the idea that we should have some scrutiny over these kinds of transactions makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's evidence of some conflict here. We have in the US extensive disclosure rules 
uh, under uh, section uh, th under uh, Regulation 13E3 that requires private equity buyouts to have lots of disclosure. We also have judicial review that provides lots of scrutiny. Makes a lot of sense given the possibility of this conflict and the evidence that CEOs benefit personally in these transactions. But I want to say one more thing about this, which is that in the U.S., there has evolved a practice that when there is a leverage buyout like this, the CEO is not involved. Everyone says, look, it would be a really bad conflict for the CEO. So let's have the negotiation when she's not in the room. Yeah, we'll be really careful. She won't be part of the discussion. This way she can't be conflicted. You know, I've never understood this because, I mean, the CEO knows if it's a private equity buyer that things are going to work out very well. Yeah? So the fact that they're not in the room or negotiating before the fact, I don't think improves that situation at all. It's just a question of whether or not they get paid ex post or have an agreement ex ante. And the disadvantage from shareholders' point of view of doing it ex post is that they don't know when they approve the transaction what the arrangements are likely to be. So one suggestion I make in the paper is that these kinds of arrangements, what the CEO will get after a buyout, should be agreed and disclosed before the transaction occurs. This way, when you disclose to public company shareholders, we're doing a leverage buyout, here are the terms of the buyout, the shareholders can review and approve what the CEO will get after the fact. That is, I don't think this is necessarily objectionable, but I think it runs the risk of an undisclosed conflict to shareholders. So I would tighten our disclosure rules even further on these types of transactions to include details about uh, CEO pay. So just two high level things that I think we can learn from studying these special types of controlling shareholders. First, uh, it seems that managerial influence in the US affects CEO compensation, but not necessarily in the way you'd think. Not that they get paid too much, but instead in the relationship between their pay and performance. One more thing on that, by the way. If you said to me, you can fix one thing in the world, you can either stop CEOs from getting paid too much or fix the link between the pay and performance, it would not be hard for me to choose. I would definitely choose the link between pay and performance. Yeah? I happily give away some money by mistake to CEOs. This is a consequence of a, the error that all humans make. But if we miss the link between pay and performance, we get errors in capital allocation, investments, um, uh, uh, where we put money in society. This is much more costly in my view. This was why it makes sense that Henry Kravis focuses on the pay performance link. And I think we should too. And in the paper I explain ways that we can change the law to do that. And then second, the fact that these incumbent CEOs are getting more money in these transactions confirms our suspicion that these conflicts may raise real problems justifies, I think, additional disclosure in uh, judicial scrutiny, and I think suggests that that scrutiny should focus on CEO arrangements. So that's the paper. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I look forward to talking over you much. <laughs>